and especially professors Claudia Hopkins and Theus Bates for the opportunity to present my work in this forum. Images of the fire at the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro have spread throughout the world on September 2018. Among the precious collections of the first museum created in Brazil in 1818, there was one of pieces seized by the police in Afro-Brazil and religious communities in 1880s. Like many of other collections of that museum, unfortunately, this one is almost totally lost. Although some pieces have survived, there are photographic records for the, and the catalog of Kumbu Kumbu, the last exhibition held with it. The loss is irreparable. The, man, the damage caused to that collection is a terrible fact and unfortunately an additional chapter in the troubled history of the social insertion of Afro-Brazilian religious artifacts. Due to the forced transposition of women and men from certain African regions to the to be enslaved in the Portuguese colony in South America from the 16th century. There exist religious practices in Brazil linked mainly to Central and West Africa. Belief systems from Africa, South America and Europe were mixed in varied ways, configuring connected but also somewhat diverse religious practices over time and space with different designation Batuque, Candomblé, Jurema, Macumba, Tambor de Mina, and Xango, among others, they have been brought together under the expression Afro-Brazilian religions. From the collusion between Catholicism and Portuguese colonialism, which persisted after Brazil became an independent nation in 1822, these religions practices continue to be persecuted and marginalized. Its people, their rights and values, as well as the material culture they created and used, were relegated to the margins, when not social limbo. After the official end of slavery in the country in 1888, and the change of Brazil's political regime from Catholic monarchy to secular republic in the following year, the social situation of these religions had not improved. From the criminal code then in force in the country, which restricted certain religious practices, especially those linked to African belief systems, the police invaded religious communities in different Brazilian cities, interrupted rituals, imprisoned people, confiscated and destroyed many objects, arbitrary, those police raids aimed at curbing cultural practices of marginalized and vulnerable social segments. Apparently not guided by precise criteria regarding the production of criminal evidence, they collected diverse objects whose set did not delineate a specific typology, but a heterogeneity that not infrequently seems to be chaotic. Indeed, the first collections of artifacts used in Afro-Brazilian religions were formed from coercive police actions on religious communities in different states from north to south of Brazil. Analyzing the police pursuit of Bahian Candomblé between 1920 and 1942, ethnomusicologist Angela Lanning reports that, I quote, the seized objects of worship were either destroyed or taken to the Geographical and Historical Institute, end of quote, which won what the press presented as bubbles and trinkets, words with which I can barely try to translate the expressions bujindangas and trossos. In Rio de Janeiro, the capital of Brazil then, Many pieces seized by the police have disappeared, 
while others have been integrated into collections from different institutions. Besides the collection of the aforementioned National Museum, other Caesar pieces were integrated into the collections of the National Historic Museum, probably because of actions undertaken by Gustavo Barroso, director yeah. of the institution between 1922 and 1959, who included the art of witchcraft among the popular art and craft forms as he names it, in his proposal for a Brazilian archaeological museum. In the same city, a third collection was configured by the police and integrated in the 1920s to the museum they maintain, which served to train agents and from the follow following decade was open to the public. In the same, in the name of this collection, Museum of Black Magic, which obviously opposes Afro-Brazilian religion to Catholicism, Black magic to white religion, it's easy to notice the social disputes at play, the hierarchies established from race, culture, and class. In addition to Rio de Janeiro, there are similar collections in different institutions from historical and geographical societies to Museum of Ethnography, Archaeology, Anthropo Anthropology, and History. Given the lack of the criteria of police seizures, these collections are constituted by a wide variety of objects. Taking the collection of the Rio de Janeiro Police Museum as example, we find manually produced artifacts for Afro-Brazilian religious ceremonies if not specially made in rituals, musical instruments, clothing, and other elements used by deities to store things, drink, and smoke during the trance, as well as part of sacred composite objects that embody deities and enchanting artifacts like this bottle or these dolls. But in that collection, there are also objects not restricted to the religious sphere, such as a notice board and a ferule, which were adapted to ritual uses. And artifacts also related to other mythologies and religions like a mermaid and some images that would supposedly be exclusive to the Catholic realm. Not to mention pieces industrially manufactured, utilitarian or not, such as a smoke package and even a German made felt doll representing an African warrior. Sometimes the police actions were reported by the press with texts and images of police raids, arrests of religious people, and seizures of objects. However, the situation of African-based religions in Brazilian society was anything but univocal. If it horrified those who had European bourgeois way of life as a model of modern civilization, it did not fail to make a huge attraction. In fact, many of those who persecuted those religious practices publicly attended them in secret, as João do Rio observed in his 1904 journalistic report about religions in Rio de Janeiro, republished as a book, which was an editorial, a great editorial success. Analyzing uh, criminal prosecutions that imprison many religions, people, anthropologist Yvonne Magui concludes that belief and fear of sorcery affected people of all classes. She argues that repression was inscribed in the belief realm and served to organize the religious field with the participation of the followers of these religions themselves, trying to distinguish the good from the bad religious leaders, those who did witchcraft and misused their supernatural powers 
from those who use their powers for good. Thus, the existence of studies with varied intentions and tones about Afro-Brazilian religions, published newspapers, weekly magazines, academic and avant-garde journals and books is not surprising. While some of these studies contributed to the maintenance of prejudice, on the other hand, they help it to affirm the public existence of those religions practices. In addition to disseminating information about them, their agents and their material culture, contributing for its preservation. It's noteworthy how some of these studies include mentions to this religion's material culture, not only as a criminal evidence, which were sometimes accompanied by photographs and drawings of artifacts, such as those by Fernando Correia Dia, a Portuguese artist based in Brazil then, and journalist, Brazilian journalist Armando Magalhães Correia. In such a way that while some pieces move from terreiros to police stations and from these to archives, museums, historical and geographical institutes, the images of some objects circulated from newspapers to artistic studios, transiting through different media from photographs to drawing and paintings. In this process, we can observe the preference for certain objects, mainly anthropomorphic sculptures. It's the case of a no shape a wooden axe, an insignia of the Orisha Shango from an unknown religious community that reached the collection of the National Museum. First, its photograph illustrated the text of Etienne Brasil in 1911. Magalhães Correa draw and included it in his 1932 article in the Ukrainian living in Brazil painter Dmitry Ismailovich included it in one untitled 1940 canvas with other African and Afro-Brazilian elements. Unfortunately, this Oche is one of the pieces that existed until the fire devoured the National Museum's collection in September 2018. Artists affiliated to different aesthetic trends were interested in Afro-descendants and their culture. Evidence of this process is easily found in the artistic production of that period in Brazil. Spanish Modesto Brocos, Lithuanian Lazar Segal, and Brazilian Candido Portinari, among other artists, were interested in people of African descent and their culture. As I said earlier, Africanism is one important aspect of artistic modernity in Brazil since the end of 19th century. If many of them came to portray real, idealized, or stereotyped African and Afro descendants to represent scenes of their cultural living practices and even some Afro-Brazilian rituals, few attempt specifically to the artifacts manufactured and used in those codes. Among this field, I highlight specifically specific works made by Fernando Correa Dias, Cecilia Meireles, Armando Magalhães Correa, Oswaldo Gildi, and Dmitry Smailovich. However, they went little further than figuring these objects, not even considering them as paradigms of the renewal of artworks, artisanal or industrialized objects. In Brazil, few artists became interested in the material culture of Afro-Brazilian religions, but took it more as a theme than as a visual reference for their works. And apparently they had no contact with the critical text that thought those artifacts as art at the same time. These artists represented 
exotic objects in an iconic way, but did not use them in a structural review of artistic representation codes, as did Picasso, Matisse, and other artists, and on which Daniel Kahnweiler and Carl Einstein theorized. What indicates the limits both of how these Brazilian artists assimilated post-Cubist art and of how they related to Africans and, Af and people of African descent in Brazil. For them, the material culture of African-based religions was a reference of cultural otherness, but not an artistic paradigm. The resonance of Afro-Brazilian religions in the artistic domain are just one of the evidences of how, at the time, the traditionally negative understanding of people of African descent, their culture and contributions to Brazilian society was confronted by more positive visions, although these were not free from prejudice and simplification. In this process, one important fact is to the recognition of part of the collection of Afro-Brazilian religious artifacts from the Police Museum in Rio de Janeiro as Brazilian national heritage by the National Historic and Artistic Heritage Institute in 1938 an exceptional action in many aspects. However, it's worth mentioning that the collection was inscribed, is still as Museum of Black Magic, not in the Book of Artistic Heritage, but in the Book of Archaeological, Ethnographic, and Landscape Heritage. The architectural vagueness of this Ismailovich canvas, whose pointed art is not found in the National Muse Museum, nor is it particularly characteristic of police stations or religious communities, can be associated with the institutional and social indeterminacy of these artifacts. In short, Afro Brazilian religious artifacts, which existed in social marginality, were sometimes apprehended by the police, being framed as criminal evidence and used for didactic purpose in the training of state agents of police control, were also sometimes publicly presented by the press, artistically figured, ethnographically valued, and even considered as national emblems. If between the end of 19th century and mid 20th century, artifacts used in religious practice in Brazil linked to African belief systems were not considered as design references, as industrial or artisanal paradigms or artistic reference. Four authors published texts proposing the public recognition of their artistic dimension, with which began the process of their integration into the art canon in Brazil. These authors are Raimundo Nina Rodrigues and Arthur Ramos, physicians who, were considered, who are considered as the founders of anthropology as an academic field in Brazil. Manuel Querino, an artist, teacher of drawing and self-taught historian. And Mario Barata, a museum expert who later became art critic and art historian. Instead of trinkets and baubles, they postulated those artifacts as work of arts. <coughs> Nina Rodriguez, the author of the fetishist animism of blacks from Bahia, a pioneering work on candomblé that was published in four articles in Portuguese in Cosmos, an illustrated weekly magazine in 1896, and a book in French four years later. The artifacts used in the rituals have no greater prominence in that work due to its broad character, but what studied by the author in fine arts among the black settlers in Brazil, the sculpture, an article published in the same magazine in 1904. Unless I'm mistaken, this text is the first to analyze with scientific parameters the Afro-Brazilian religious artifacts. Nina Rodrigues is considered the father of the field of Afro-Brazilian studies. Anthropologists Ivone Magui and Peter Fry have already noted that Nina Rodrigues, I quote, 
did much more than describe Kanon as in Bahia of his times. He established ways of understanding this phenomenon that permeated the writing of all who followed him. He established the themes and issues that fascinate scholars to this day, end of quote. In my view, it's not different with the artistic dimension of the Afro-Brazilian religious artifacts. The best example is Arthur Ramos, whose professional intellectual trajectory has points of proximity and distance from Nina Rodriguez. Among many consonants, it's worth remembering that in 1935, Ramos re-edited the fetishist animism of blacks from Bahia, collecting the articles that have been published in Portuguese and comparing them with the text of the French book edition. However, it should be noted that in 1938, Ramos also re-edited some essays by Manuel Querino in the volume African <laughs> in which is included the African race and its customs in Bahia, a text that Querino <sighs> presented at the fifth Brazilian Congress of Geography held in Salvador in 2012 and first published in the events proceedings in 1916. In 1941, Mario Barata tried to think of the material culture of Macumba in Candomblé as art in black art, a text he published in an illustrated weekly magazine. Eight years later, Ramos published the, black, the text Black Art in Brazil, in which he takes up the theme of Nina Rodrigues and Quirinus articles published before increasing focus, references, concepts, and methods of analysis. In 1950, Barata returned to the theme in the article, Sculpture of Black Origin in Brazil, firstly presented at the first Congress of Brazilian Negro, which was published only in 1956 in a cultural magazine edited by students of architecture. With this text, the incorporation of Afro-Brazilian religious artifacts into the canon of art in Brazil started from the fields of anthropology, which Nina Rodrigues inaugurated and Ramos helped to consolidate, of history in which Manuel Querino was self-taught, of museum studies in which Barata was trained and worked when he wrote his 1941 text, and of art criticism in which he was active in 1950s. However, if we consider the bibliographic references articulated by these authors in this text, the set of disciplines mobilized to think about the material culture of Afro-Brazilian religions is much larger, including medicine, ethnology, anthropology, history, literature, art, and art criticism. This text circumscribes a singular hybrid and plural theoretical landscape to think of some types of objects. In Europe and the US, the canon of African art was established from the relations between artists, art critics, art historians, anthropologists, museum experts, dealers, and art collectors. The Brazilian case is different. In that country, the understanding of the material culture of African-based religion as art was not conceived by artists and apparently received no attention from art dealers. In the proposition of the canon of the so-called black art in Brazil, the medical anthropologist and the museum expert, later art critic, dealt with religious principles, practices, and objects, various interpretive theories, and indirectly, but very importantly, the police real. Querino's case is quite different as he interviewed Africans and their direct descendants, even mentioning and including photographs of a particular religious community, the still existing Gantua Terreiro in Salvador, Bahia. In his text, Querino affirms he respected what he was allowed to observe and know in that religious community. On the other hand, sorry, 
Nina Rodrigues Barata and Ramos dealt with collections gathered from police apprehensions. In his 1904 text, Nina Rodrigues analyzed a work by the Geographical and Historical Institute of Bahia. But it is Barata who most uses objects belonging to institutions. In the 1941 text, he analyzed pieces incorporated into the collections of the National Museum and the National Historical Museum, as well as the police, Rio de Janeiro Police Museum. In this report, he informs his intention to, I quote, explain the position of black art in Brazil, mainly, mainly through idols from Rio's Macumba collected by the civil police in the campaign recently carried out, end of quote, presenting a piece, I quote, harvested a few days ago by the Rio police in one of the Macumbas recently closed, end of quote. Here is mentioning a police campaign devised by Rio chief of police, Filinto Miller, an anti-communist and sympathizer of Nazism that over two days in late March, 1941, invaded 70 terreiros and arrested 80 leaders and which was named by the press as Blitzkrieg, which indicates the resonance of both World War II and Nazism in the country then. Indeed, Barata's rare and surprisingly neutral reference to the repressive police action makes explicit the existing links between intellectuals and museums with the police domain. In addition to collections derived from police actions, Nina Rodriguez, Ramos and Barata dealt with their own pieces since they constituted private collections for themselves in parallel to their studies. However, their collections were forged not only with scientific theories, fieldwork, artistic and cultural values, but also resulted from police actions as evidenced by the references to those actions and the resulting collections in their texts. Therefore, police officers operating in raids and police stations should be seen as the primary and apparently involuntary and unconscious curators of public collections of, of Afro-Brazilian religions artifacts. Thus, state control and repression of Afro-Brazilian religions determined to varying degrees the selection of much of the pieces that they have been preserved in a appreciated as art, a process that is still affects public and private collections, critical appraisals, and the Afro-Brazilian artistic canon. Nina Rodrigues, Barat, and Ramos were not selected from values, judgments shared by the creators or users, uh, the, the items they collect were not selected by judgments shared by the creators and or users in the religious realms. Perhaps the values and judgments shared by the creators and users of those artifacts have affected these later critics in the composition of their private collections, but they certainly interfered very little in the selective process of the pieces seized by the police. Like the police officers, these authors acted with limited choice. In addition to not having plans to systematically collect the material culture of Afro-Brazilian religions, the police officers had to select the criminal evidences from sets of objects found in varied contexts and casual circumstances, which were not necessarily the best examples of the entire material culture of that religious universe. The critics in turn dealt with the somewhat arbitrary collection generated by police seizures and on the other hand, composed their private collections based on their knowledge and interests, which helps to understand why Nina Rodriguez, Ramos and Barata did not analyze all types of artifacts manufactured and used in the Afro-Brazilian religious realm. 
nor did they even fully study the collection created from police stations, for police actions. Faced with such heterogeneous set of objects, they fall short of the material complexity of the Afro-Brazilian religious universe and the diversity inherent to those seizures and collections, both in what they select to analyze and in the collections generated from police seizures and in what they chose to acquire for themselves, these authors almost always dealt with object typologies similar to those of European artistic culture. They departed from what they understood as an art object and did not think the specificity of those religions and their material culture. It's not by chance that both Nina Rodriguez and Barata's second text separated just half a century focus on the same type of object, sculpture, the artistic category most associated with African culture since the beginning of 20th century. Differently, Querino presented the fetishist cult as he names the religion of the Orishas, its deities, their symbolic attributes and many rituals, space objects and outfit, as well as its many specific terms. Although he presents Bayan cuisine as art in a text that was published posthumously in 1928, in his 1916 text, he connects only a small part of the material culture of this religion to art, addressing the industry of religious people of African descent, the knowledge of ritualistic making or transforming places, things and bodies. He observes the tendency towards the liberal arts exclusively in the sculpture of fetish symbols, as, his name, as he named it, perhaps due to the criteria learned in his fine arts training. It's noteworthy that in his two 1909 books dedicated to recovered trajectories and achievements of artists born or working in Bahia, he even includes technical and manual workers, revealing an understanding of art beyond traditional artistic categories that can be connected to his labor act activism but without mentioning the Afro-Brazilian religious real. Qualifying as art was not necessarily considered as such by the creators and users of those religious artifacts. These four authors did not ask to practitioners of African-based religions what things could be qualified as works of art according to the values and aesthetic principles at stake at that religious universe. In the cases of Nina Rodriguez, Barat, and Ramos, they did not notice or consciously decided to silent about many artifacts, which remained in critical limbo because they were not even qualified as utilitarian objects or sacred images. However, to be fair to these authors, it's necessary to point out that especially Nina Rodriguez and Ramos, but also Barata in his first text, thought to combine European artistic categories with ethnological and anthropological principles in their analysis of the material culture proper to Afro-Brazilian religion, which led them to incorporate other types of artifacts in their texts. Nina Rodrigues presents ceremonial insignia as sculptures, and Barata considers ceramic pots as art, but it is Ramos who most propose other types of objects, such as ceremonial weapons and other religious insignias, amulets, beads and jewelry, as well as wood and iron sculptures. Although they were sometimes limited by previous police choice, these authors tried to outline methods of analysis that attempt to reconcile art criticism and anthropology of art among other disciplines to understand these objects. Querino's case is quite different here again. 
as he virtually embraces people, rituals, and material culture in his study, but draws only sculpted images to the artistic category. The better translation of Liu Frobenius' 1897 book's title, The Bildende Kunst der Afrika, would be the visual arts of Africa. But at that time in Brazil, nobody referred to sculpture as visual arts. Thus, Nina Rodriguez used fine arts in the title of his article. In doing so, consciously or not, he included the Afro-Brazilian religious artifacts in the fine arts realm. However, it's difficult to imagine the agents in the institutions that then taught, exhibited, judged, edited, and marketed the artistic production from academic principles, accepting as works of art, the objects analyzed by him. However, throughout the text, Nina Rodriguez also qualifies them as black art, a designation that was used by authors then. Consolidated and widespread in art and art studies in Africa, on Africa, this term is also used by Hermos and Barata in his first text like Quirino, who seemed to distinguish and keep apart the academic art world in which he was trained in the Afro-Brazilian religious domain. Barata also opposed these realms, but from his affiliation to modernistic, to the, the modernist artistic movement and its preference for primitivism. That in 1906, Nina Rodriguez was unable to pursue the synchronicity of his analysis with the changing meaning that African artifacts were having in certain European and US contexts. It does not seem that Quirino knew about this change and if he did, he did not adhere to it. But Barat and Hamus were aware that they were contributing to a field that had been mapped and worked for more than three decades including Nina Rodriguez and Kevin Brazil. In any case, both the conceptualization as cultural customs or artworks and the framing as national heritage can be seen as modes of social liberation of those objects and consequently of the authors who were named as artists in this text, although not their names, the particular names record. We can also see this liberation regarding the users of those artifacts, since they gain public acknowledgement far from the moral judgment imposed by law. If circulating in the press and artistic representation enlarged the public presence, although not always in a positive way, the registration as national heritage was an official recognition of the objects previously apprehended, as well as the religious practices to which they were linked as cultural emblems of the Brazilian nation. While the critical endorsement as works of art, including them in the national artistic canon, promoted a certain aesthetic emancipation. The critical recognition was not altogether liberating due to the ambiguities inherent in the subsidiary judgment to those author's tax. A pioneer in trying to criticize in an impartial way the material culture of Afro-Brazilian religions, Nina Rodriguez does not fail to make explicit the contradictions between the theories he adopted, the data he produced, and his analysis. He exposes his hierarchical view of races according to which blacks would be inferior, have a childish mentality that would condition their religious practices and limit their creativity. Even when he positively evaluates the artifacts, Nina Rodriguez is ambiguous. On the one hand, he understands them as evidence of the artistic and intellectual dimension of black, black cultural practice which was not recognized at the time. On the other hand, he considers that they, I quote, could not want more than to document in pieces of real ethnographical value, a stage in which 
I stayed in the development of artistic culture, adding that they reveal the relatively advanced phase of the evolution of human spirit, end of quote. In analyzing pieces from his collection and that of Nina Rodriguez Ramos, uses an ambiguous conceptualization that can distance or approximate black art from primitivism. It's also the idea of primitive art that underlies Barata's text. Although, although he says with Liu Frobenius that, I quote, the idea of the barbarian Negro is an European invention, end of quote, in his 1941 text, he reverberates an evolutionary hierarchy by categorically differentiating Africans and Europeans, even saying that this culture seems to have been made by children and evaluating an idol as too primitive. Even Kenino, who fought against racism, marginalization, and devaluation of people of African descent throughout his entire life, trying to free them and their culture from the prejudice with which they were framed, still seems to consider Africans one of the non-evaluated, non-evolved races. Evolutionism that reappears when he includes them among the people in their childhood. Although the Afro-Brazilian religion's artifacts have received other critical and institutional frameworks since mid 20th century, the emancipation of these artifacts, the authors and users has yet to be fulfilled. First, due to the framing of objects, which varies according to the principles and practices of the institutions to which they belong. According to the, their variety of institutionalization, these objects will undergo different conceptual frameworks and can be presented as criminal evidences or works of art, historical documents, or anthropological records. This does not fail to highlight the complexity of these artifacts and collections, as well as how idiosyncratic archives and museums can be. However, what most affect these objects is the incipient public fruition they have, especially in the case of the collections, which remain inaccessible to the public and to scholars. To start concluding, I remember that in 1920, French writer, art critic, and collector Félix Fignon conducted an enquête in the Bulletin de la Vie Artistique interrogating as to when the so-called primitive art would be admitted to the Musée du Louvre, which eventually only occurred in the passage to the 21st century, when some African artifacts started to be exhibited in its pavilion de session. A similar debate is yet to begin in Brazil. Nina Rodriguez and Quirino, Barata and Ramos understood some artifacts used in Afro-Brazilian religions and works of art, but they did not even propose their insertion in art museums. In the field of criticism, the situation is not very different. The posterity of these texts was not encouraging for long. Disdain for Carino's work is part of the current races in Brazilian society. One can understand the lack of dialogue with these two texts of Barata, for they are exceptions in his critical and historiographical work, focused mainly on contemporary art. Lack of dialogue that is less comprehensible in the case of Nina Rodriguez and Ramos, who are considered founders of both anthropology and the field of black studies in Brazil, but whose works on the artifacts used in Brazil, Afro-Brazilian rituals have not yet resonated like the ad, other studies about these religions and peoples. It's important to emphasize the momentum that artworks, practices, and systems have res had had recently in the Brazilian anthropological field, and the greatest interest among our historians in the country by Afro-Brazilian topics. If one can no longer speak in critical silence about Afro-Brazilian art, 
the aesthetic and artistic dimension of African-based religions is one of the least studied subfields. And this greater critical interest has not yet had corresponding developments in collecting or in the preservation exhibition and discussion of the institutional situation of these collections. The institutional invisibility and the restrictions to full public resonance persist, composing the contemporary prejudice, constraints, and violence against Afro-Brazilian religious, its beliefs, imaginaries, and material culture. In addition, the question brought by these authors, Nina Rodrigues, then Carino Barat and Ramos, remains echoing. Should we consider these bubbles and twinkles as works of art? Thank you. <laughs>